Mr. President, Mr. Dean, Ambassadors, Consul Generals, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It is a, an honor for me to be today at the China Europe International Business School in Shanghai. And I appreciate this opportunity to talk directly to students from both ends of the Silk Road. You represent the driving force for China's and Europe's future. I find it very important that the brightest young men and women from Europe and China get an understanding, and you used also that word, Mr. Dean, of each other's cultures. It is about the other's choices and constraints, about his or her hopes and fears, about human values, about inspiration and motivation, about past experiences and the view of the future. Such knowledge, such mutual understanding, one cannot pick up in a travel guide or on a short tourist trip. You need to get a real feeling of a country and its people. Studying together is an excellent way of achieving this. I hope this school lays for many of you a sound basis of friendship and respect between cultures for the rest of your hopefully very long lives. As you probably know, China and the European Union have set up two schools together, yours and the China Europe Law School, which opened in 2008. That school, as Premier Wen said at its opening, will form legal professionals equipped with the knowledge spanning Chinese and Western laws. Another skill in high demand. It is not only highly appropriate, but also symbolic that the two existing China-EU schools start with the twin teams of business and law. Indeed, the rule of law is indispensable for the flourishing of any modern society and of any modern economy. It was the secret of Europe's early economic development five centuries ago, when the idea of a market took hold. The entrepreneurial spirit requires a stable legal framework to produce benefits for a society as a whole. It is a lesson we learn time and time again, most recently in the context of the Arab Spring. Sustainable economic and social development and stability cannot exist without the underlying fundamentals of the rule of law, social justice and human rights. The success of these two schools led to an even bigger vision. The project of bringing them together under the roof of the first Sino-European University. This university could include faculties in other areas such as journalism and communication and international relations. Now that the European Union has its own service for external relations, it could be an excellent training ground for future diplomats. I welcome this project. It is an opportunity to improve our cooperation and the true investment in our shared future. I was also pleased to learn that your school, founded in 1994, is now China's number one business school and among the world's top 20. I would be proud to belong to such a prestigious institution. It is perhaps another symbol that the city of Shanghai plays host to the school. The opening up of China's economy in the past three decades has resulted in a tremendous transformation, most clearly on view in Shanghai itself. And yesterday, upon landing, I was deeply impressed by the skyline of Pudong. And even more so, when I learned that 20 years ago, where these proud towers now stand, one could only see some 
empty fields. Ladies and gentlemen, the transformation of China, which is your daily bread, is transforming the world economy as a whole. And that's why in the European Council of the 27 heads of state or government, which I chair, we address the issue regularly. Today I should like to talk about the economic challenges of Europe and China, about how we can work better together to create sustainable economic growth and jobs for our citizens in a world which is ever more interdependent. I should like in particular to address in turn global economic interdependence and its consequences, the challenges for the Eurozone and the European economies, and the bilateral relationship between China and the EU in trade and other areas and how we can further improve it to create growth and stimulate investment. Ladies and gentlemen, first a word on global economic interdependence. The recent economic crisis has demonstrated who extraordinarily intertwined the global economy has become. The downturn in the American housing market spread to the financial markets, not only over there, but worldwide. After the collapse of the Lehman Brothers in September 2008, many economies fell into a recession. All started with the collapse of one bank in the United States. When navigating the stormy waters of 2008, it became increasingly clear that we had to address the challenges of the economic and financial crisis in a coherent and in a coordinated manner. And thus, at the initiatives of the Europeans, the G20 emerged at the height of the crisis as the premier forum for economic and financial cooperation, bringing all major economies around the table at the highest level. A determined and concerted policy action by political leaders promoting financial stability and supporting demand allowed us to avoid a systemic meltdown, meltdown as well as an outright depression. It was an unprecedented achievement of global governance. China has contributed hugely to the stabilization of the world economy by leading the global economy recovery, boosted by a massive stimulus package. It thereby also contributed to putting an end to the deepest, longest, and most broad-based recession in Europe since the depression of the 30s. With China and the EU being two of the main economic powers in the world, we do not only share common interests, but also common responsibilities towards each other and the global system. In my view, the G20 framework for growth should remain a key instrument to foster economic policy coordination and cooperation at global level. As major economies, China and the EU need to do their part to achieve the agreed objectives for strong, balanced and sustainable growth. Credible medium-term fiscal policy strategies will contribute to a reduction in public deficits and public debt. Appropriate exchange rates and a sharp focus on pushing forward structural reforms are also needed. To achieve those objectives, it is necessary to analyze and, if needed, address the causes of global macroeconomic imbalances. It is important to address sustained large current account surpluses just as it is important to address the deficits. Nobody has an interest in prolonging an unsustainable situation. I therefore welcome the ambition of the Chinese leadership to rebalance China's growth model in the medium term by stimulating consumption it will be key to secure a more resilient and inclusive growth for China. And at the same time, it would make an important contribution to the rebalancing of growth at the global level. 
Exchange rates have to translate economic realities and fundamentals, as was agreed at the G20 summit in Seoul last year. Non-appropriate exchange rates contribute to internal imbalances as external ones. Moreover, the impact of one's exchange rate on the global system is bigger to the extent one's economy grows. The correction of imbalances can be gradual and has to be mutual, of course. We made progress the last six months in the right direction. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say a few words, secondly, about the economic situation in Europe and in the Eurozone in particular, my core business. Last year, we faced an important challenge, a crisis of sovereign debt in the Eurozone. At some point, starting from a problem in Greece, one country, 10 million inhabitants, the financial stability of the Eurozone as a whole was threatened, 350 million citizens. It forced us as political leaders to act with determination to make sure that we prevent such a crisis from happening again. And that is what we did and what we continue to do. We are also addressing the wider economic challenges. All EU countries are bringing down public deficits. The most vulnerable countries are undertaking determined action to come out of the crisis. Two countries, Greece and Ireland, have received financial assistance with very strict policy packages of measures to be taken. An agreement with Portugal has been reached as well. And allow me to remind, you, to remind you that although these countries enjoy a disproportionately high attention of the press, together they represent only 6% of the Eurozone's GDP. Only 6%. Newspaper headlines might sometimes overshadow that the economic recovery in Europe as a whole is on track and even gaining momentum in some member states. Our economic fundamentals remain sound. We expect a growth rate of about 2% in the Union this year and the same percentage in 2012. Last week, the International Monetary Fund expressed its quiet confidence in the European recovery, both in the Western and Eastern regions. These growth rates figures may seem modest compared to the current Chinese growth rate. But taking into account that it takes in, it takes in place in mature economies with already a very high standard of living and with a develop, developed social protection, it is really not bad at all. Yet we do need higher structural growth and we are working on it. The positive outlook is supported by upbeat cross-sector EU business sentiment and better prospects for the global economy. And despite some noise and setbacks, the fact remains that we have the largest internal market in the world with 500 million mostly prosperous consumers. Our macroeconomic fundamentals for example, public deficit, public debt, inflation, a current account of the balance of payments in equilibrium are stronger than in the most other advanced economies. The euro, ladies and gentlemen, is a very strong currency, trusted by investors worldwide. And let us not forget the bigger picture after a past of wars and conflicts, Europe has become a haven of stability and of peace. However, Europeans are acutely aware that in today's globalized world, they have to become more competitive. To keep the European model, a system producing welfare with respect for the environment and social justice, to keep that we have to need to we need more economic growth 
in our overall economic strategy, the so-called EU 2020 strategy. We call this smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. But growth is the key word. At the end of the day, we can only solve our budgetary problems and maintain or increase our standards of living and societal model if we create jobs and structural economic growth. The countries of the European Union, therefore, also undertake major reforms to strengthen their long-term growth policies. We invest in our future. Much work is done by the countries themselves, pension reforms, labor market reforms, and other ones. One out of the many, many elements in our European strategy for growth is to make the internal market our biggest asset, more attractive for investors. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to my third and last issue. How can the European Union and China better work together to create growth and jobs for our citizens? How can we create an environment where you as young entrepreneurs to be can seize opportunities for the benefit of society? Maybe most of you were too young to read the newspapers, but only two decades ago, China and the EU traded almost nothing at all. Here again, the speed of change is amazing. Today, China is the 